Utah. The unique beauty and diverse environment of this state invites thousands of visitors every year. World-class skiing, panoramic vistas, off-road biking, hiking and camping, boating and fishing, and myriads of other activities provide a wealth of scenic wonders and recreational opportunities for adventure seekers. But lurking in the background of Utah's rich environment are some unwanted guests. And some are wreaking havoc with the natural ecosystems that make Utah so unique. Just a short list of these invaders indicates the magnitude of the problem. But what's being done to mitigate the effects of these invaders? How are they really affecting the environment? These and a multitude of other questions plague political leaders, environmentalists, rangers, wildlife specialists, and local agencies who confront the effects of these unwanted visitors every day. However, one critical component in the battle against these invasive species is public awareness of the ecological, physical dangers, and economic costs of these invaders. And that will be the focus of this documentary. Many people have likely heard about the quagga and zebra mussel problems, especially those who enjoy any water sports. But just what are they? Oh gosh, quagga and zebra mussels are freshwater mollusks. Essentially, they're a two-sided uh, bivalve. They start as a microscopic organism and they're called a veliger. Uh, that's probably the hardest um, to detect because you cannot see them. They free float in the water, but you can have hundreds if not thousands of veligers in a liter of water. Uh, as they start to grow, they do have the two sides look very much like a clam and have varying stripes, light and dark stripes on them. They also also have are very distinct because of their what's called a bissel thread. Uh, they use this to attach onto hard surfaces and are onto each other. They are the only freshwater or mollusk that can attach uh, to hard surfaces, which makes them extremely invasive. Uh, quagga mussels are a non-native or invasive species of mussel that basically can be dispersed or spread and cause large implications to any type of waterway or operation of a waterway such as a dam, spillway, or equipment. What kind of damage can these mussels do to the ecosystem? Oh gosh, they do many things from uh, just their ability to attach allows them to get up in all the nooks and crannies inside the boats, inside air conditioners, motors, generators, live wells where you can't see. Um, they also um, are able to get up inside the dam that produces electricity uh, and can clog the different types of systems. However, they also are filter feeders, so they filter all the nutrient out of the water, which then essentially cuts off the bottom of the food chain that uh, zooplankton and plankton are eaten. Smaller fish have nothing to eat. It, it causes a crash in the ecosystem. If they're on the uh, beaches or shorelines, um, you know, we have a lot of dogs that love to enjoy Lake Powell or run along the beach, and if there's mussels there, they, it will cut you. They can basically completely cover an area, so it becomes really ineffective or unproductive um, for any type of animal to be able to feed on the substrate or the rock in that area. How were these invaders introduced into Utah's water system? They are native to the Black and Caspian Seas of Ukraine. They are thought to have been brought over to the United States in 1998 in the ballast tanks of ocean-going ships. It was back in 1998 that a group of scientists out of Salt Lake City, Utah, had predicted Lake Powell would be the first body of water west of the 100th meridian that would become infested with quagga and or zebra mussels. That is when we started our prevention program to be able to prevent the infestation. Lake Mead became infested in 2007. Um, it was about five years later that Lake Powell actually did fall to, to the invasion. Why is Lake Powell so susceptible to these invaders? You know what, Lake Powell becomes such a target because of the high visitation. Much like Lake Mead, we have hundreds of thousands, of millions of people that come here. We average anywhere from three to two to four million visitors a year. 
what's being done to eradicate and control the spread of their population? Uh, we have addressed this by having a containment program here at Glen Canyon. Uh, we've been a leader in the prevention world and now are a leader in the containment where we uh, monitor all boats coming and leaving, essentially talk to boaters about their um, next place of launch, whether or not they're able to clean their boat, dry their boat, and let it dry for a certain amount of time before they are going to another body of water, providing tagging, education, and decontamination when necessary for transport. In the state of Utah, it is mandatory for boaters to stop at an inspection station. To kayak even, uh, you must stop and go through their abatement process. Essentially, there will be a technician that will help you uh, inspect your boat, look for attached AIS and or just water. Simple wet or dirty boats can transport this invasive species. So. There's state uh, boat checks on most freeways. There's a lot of public information. Sites that are already infested, they require uh, treatment of those boats prior to being leaving the site. Decontamination centers are critical to ensuring that these species aren't spread to other water bodies. What can the public do to help control them? The, the best thing for everybody is to clean your boat, drain your boat, pull all plugs. Any bit of water can hold hundreds of microscopic organisms that you cannot see. So we hear a lot about invasive animals, but one of the biggest problems in our Utah ecosystem is caused by a plant, the tamarisk. What's a tamarisk, you ask? It's a shrub that is found in and along water bodies. Two species of tamaris, which were introduced into this country in the 1880s and 1890s as stream erosion control species. Why they did that, we're not quite sure because there's some really good native species that actually do a better job, but they, bring, they brought in tamarisk. Primarily, the first, the first efforts were in California, associated with uh, um, projects down around Imperial Valley, and from there it spread. Uh, the tamarisk is one of a lot of invasive species that affects uh, particularly the western United States. Why is the tamarisk considered an invasive species? Um, it's invasive in areas where there's been water developments primarily, or diversions. So in other words, you have a dam upstream, you divert much of the water, you reduce the water that's coming out of the dam, you got all this new habitat, the first thing that gets there is going to establish. And it's generally the first thing that gets there is tamarisk. So it spread from these canals, uh, these earthen canals down in California and elsewhere in Nevada, and started to move into these uh, the Colorado River Basin and, and its, its tributaries, and then over into the Rio Grande and, and elsewhere further north. So it, 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 it seizes opportunities when they're there, and it does it by producing millions of seeds. A large plant can have as many as a million to, to several million seeds produced in a year, and they remain viable long enough that they can actually they can, they can uh, germinate uh, the next season, typically the, the year that they are, they are produced, however. What's being done to control the spread of tamarisk? Well, unfortunately, eradication is kind of off the table now that it's naturalized in our ecosystem here. Tamarisk, in particular, will lower nutritional values for wildlife. Um, it greatly disrupts the ecological balances in riparian areas. It can affect stream channels. There's either uh, mechanical, chemical, handwork, and biological control. Uh, that's, that's being applied. Uh, you can do hand control and hand thinning, uh, but it doesn't work very well because you can't kill the plant, it just re-sprouts. Uh, some people tried fire in the early days, but tamarisk is fire adapted. It actually likes fires, so it comes back even thicker. And We go in with hand, uh, usually hand tools or chainsaws, and we generally do a, like a cut stump method where you actually cut uh, near the base of the plant, near the, uh, near the, the ground surface, and you squirt a little bit of a, a, a herbicide onto it. And that, it's got a very effective rate. And it's, it's not a particularly difficult plant to kill with herbicides, but it's really the only way before the beetle came along that we could actually control the species in the Southwest. If we introduce the tamarisk beetle to control this plant, might we not cause another problem trying to control the beetle? Uh, the beetle was not actually intentionally introduced by the federal government by the USDA or APHIS in Utah. It was introduced um, by some county people over in Moab at Grand Junction, or I mean Grand County. 
Uh, and, it's, and it's amazing some of the changes we've seen in certain areas where there's really dense tamarisk stands and nothing much else, no natives. It, it's, 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 it's gone through them like fire and just killed you know, thousands of plants. It's really quite amazing. The tamarisk leaf beetle uh, often occurs in, in populations of millions or hundreds of millions of individuals. So down, down the road, you know, how evolution works in large populations, mutations can occur. And it's possible down the road that it could jump to some native uh, plant group in the country. But at this stage, it's, it's not considered a concern, at least for the next um, few decades. What can the general public do to help with this problem? Um, something just as little as knowing, hey, you need to wash off seed that's on your truck or anything, picking the seeds out of your socks before you go to a new location, things like that to help stop the spread of these invasive species. Uh, there's volunteer opportunities in different areas where, where the public can be involved. Uh, principally in, in, in uh, two areas, uh, we do have volunteer programs here and in many other parks and some of our volunteer groups that are usually associated with organizations like you know, like wilderness volunteers they can come in and help us clear this stuff out and they, they, they get a lot of education in the process and they also have a good time in the backcountry and they see lots of really beautiful landscapes the other way is through funding and the best way to for the public to help that is to support the, the land management agencies through uh, the politics and through voting for the people who support BLM and the Park Service and the Forest Service the Fish and Wildlife Service as they fight this weed. It's not the only weed in the West and, 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 and we are always cash strapped our agencies for doing this kind of work. While it's easy to sense the concern of environmentalists and wildlife species in their fight against something so noxious as a mussel or as irritating as a tamarisk shrub, it might not be as easy to sense the trouble created by this furry creature, the raccoon. Portrayed as the cuddly, fun-loving prankster of the animal kingdom, raccoons are decidedly a species that needs to be included on our list of invaders. Maybe you thought raccoons were native to Utah, but they're not. So, how did they get introduced into our ecosystem? Hitching a ride on a semi-truck uh, when they started more cross-country travel, I guess. There's always people releasing them as pets and realize they're not a great pet. What are the real problems and dangers created by raccoons? Are they really that big of an issue? Probably the main thing that makes them such a prevalent invader is they are omnivorous, so they can eat basically anything. They're very intelligent, so they can get food from about anywhere. They're very well adapted to many different environments, so. What makes them so difficult to capture and control? Raccoons are extremely, extremely smart. Um, they're one of the only mammals we have around here that, I mean, they're known to wash their food. They, people have seen them washing apples in the river, and I mean, they can easily get into garbage cans, inside houses, that kind of stuff. Some of the, I wouldn't say they spread too many diseases. They have been known to carry rabies. That is one disease they do carry. What's being done by wildlife officials to inhibit the raccoon population? We do have some trapping programs through the division. We are able to check traps out. People can come and check traps out if they have a, a raccoon problem and trap them themselves. However, it, it is illegal to let them go back into the wild if you do catch them, they need to be euthanized, so. You might be asking, what can I do? And who do I contact if I think that raccoons might be invading my area? If you have them around your house, don't feed them, don't make it easier for them to make a living there, so. so rescue places have special, they have what is called a certificate of registration that they are licensed to have certain animals, so. Main people you should contact uh, if they if you do have a raccoon or a raccoon problem is either the Division of Wildlife or your local animal control agency. This documentary identifies a fraction of the invasive species in Utah. Maybe you're asking yourself right now, okay, I understand some of the issues, but what can I do about it? I'm just one person and this looks like a pretty big problem. There are some basic ways to help. Doing your part to eliminate the spread of the problem and informing others can be a good starting point. Avoiding the introduction of other non-native species, 
Many invasive species simply can't be totally eradicated, but by controlling these non-native species, we can maintain a healthy ecosystem and avoid the physical dangers and economic costs created by these invaders.